Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, I, I'm Will Knoll. I'm the uh, di proud director of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And to kick things off today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Constantia Constantinou, the H. Carton Rogers III Vice Provost and Director of Libraries. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I am indeed the very proud H. Carton Rogers III Constantia Constantinou, Vice Provost and Director of Libraries. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you, welcome all of you, to Penn Libraries and to the Schoenberg Institute of Manuscript Studies. I am delighted about the strong partnerships that we are forming around the city of Philadelphia and soon to become, or to be known, as the city of all manuscripts. <laughs> because of Barbara and Larry's generosity and vision, which found it seems we bear the Schoenberg name proudly. And we look forward to all that we will achieve now and in the future. The reputation of Penn Libraries is synonymous with the Schoenberg Institute of Manuscript Studies. And I have the privilege of recognizing the importance of your work and your scholarship here at Penn and around the world. Welcome to the 11th Annual Schoenberg Symposium of Manuscript Studies in Digital Age. I also have the privilege today to welcome my colleague, Nicholas Herman, Curator of Manuscript Studies here at Schoenberg Institute. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone, and, and good morning. Um, Indeed, this is the beginning uh, of the uh, portion of the 11th Annual Schoenberg Symposium for Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age that's happening uh, here at Penn. Um, some of you were present last night. Um, as Constantia said, my name is Nicholas Herman. I'm curator of manuscripts here at the Schoenberg Institute. Uh, and uh, on behalf of my colleagues here uh, at SIMS, at the Kislak Center, which is our uh, Center for uh, Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts, uh, and also uh, from Penn more broadly, we'd like to welcome you here to Philadelphia and to Penn's campus. We have a great uh, roster of speakers lined up for the next two days, uh, and over 100 people registered for this uh, symposium, which I think uh, may be a record. Uh, we keep growing every year, uh, 11 years strong. Um, I wanted to begin this morning with some remarks, actually, about the genesis of the conference, its, its goals, and uh, sketch out the exciting program we've put together for you. Uh, but before I do that, I really need to offer some uh, sincere thanks to the many people who've made this event possible. And I wanted to do this right away because the work of all these people who, who made this symposium possible is, is really the frontispiece of this event and not the colophon, right? So I think it's important to, to thank people at the beginning. Um, and we can get in with the, the manuscript anecdotes uh, right away or the, you know. So uh, I put up this amazing image of Bezad the painter uh, wearing glasses, if you look very closely, from the collection of the Free Library, which was on view last night as part of a very thoughtfully uh, curated display that was arranged for us in the manuscript room. I hope many of you saw that. Um, and I hope, indeed, many of you uh, enjoyed the event last night. Uh, for me, the rare book department at the Free Library is really like a jewel in the crown of this wonderful uh, civic institution. And last night, as they've now done for us for 10 years, so since, ever since the second Schoenberg Symposium, they turned their spaces on the third floor into a kind of treasure trail of great conversation, food, wine, manuscripts, not all together at once, uh, leading literally and metaphorically to a fabulous keynote address by Susie Nash in the Elkins Room. So my thanks goes to Janine Pollock, Caitlin Goodman, and the rest of the team at the Free Library who, who put that together. And I think it's a testament to the vitality of, of this event that we had a standing room only crowd last night, despite the utterly horrific uh, weather conditions outside. And we have a great partnership uh, between Penn and the Free Library. We teach with them, we plan events together, and we work to digitize collections together. And I just wanted to say that I don't think you'll find that kind of vibrancy and enthusiasm for manuscript studies that we saw on display last night at the Free Library anywhere else at any other public library in North America, not at NYPL, not at Boston Public, not even at the Library of Congress. So let's hear it for the Free Library. Uh, 
Uh, now, the symposium, uh, uh, of course, is, is, is a, also a feat of logistics and organization. Uh, and even though we hold it every year, it's not a routine affair. And uh, as many of you know, uh, yesterday afternoon, we held a 40-person painting and illumination workshop right here in the pavilion uh, for our symposium speakers, students, and Penn uh, faculty and staff. And we had the extraordinary illuminator and calligrapher Rosemary uh, Buczek, uh, who turned the Kislak Center into a scriptorium for three magical hours. This was a kind of dream event for me and for, for many others, uh, using applied learning to, to really help us get into the mindset of what this symposium is all about. And my thanks goes out to the History of Art Department and the Wolf Humanities uh, Forum, specifically for supporting this kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, and also to our head of conservation, Sarah Rydell, and her team who were instrumental in helping to set up and, and take down this, this workshop. And as, as, as those of you who were here yesterday afternoon know, we were faced with a kind of crisis situation. We had snow apocalypse gridlock descend on Philadelphia yesterday afternoon um, that scuppered our, our best laid plans right, to have a bus to take everyone to the free library. But Betsy Bates, Eddie Mizukane, Alita Arthurs, and Emma Caulfield really rose to the challenge. Uh, and we were able to uh, take the trolley, um, 30 of us, and trek up 19th Street uh, to the Free Library where we were warmly welcomed. And so I do also want to thank our extraordinary new Vice Provost, Constantia, who, who, who just spoke, uh, whose camaraderie and enthusiasm uh, were on full display last night. Uh, and it's really, it's really inspiring to have uh, a leader who's, who's so supportive of what we do. Um, a lot of behind-the-scenes work, I want to thank our wonderful graduate students, uh, Eileen Malcolm, Judith Weston, and especially our Kislak fellow, Mariah Min, uh, who, who did a lot of work to make today happen. Uh, our session chairs, who volunteered to uh, uh, introduce uh, and, and, and um, deal with the question period for each session. Um, our friends at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Shelley Langdale and Tom Primo, who have generously agreed uh, to do something very special. Um, They're going to show us the Collins Hours, this wonderful manuscript that was the subject of yesterday's keynote. Uh, today, up here at, at lunch hour um, in the Lee Library, which is this wonderful historic paneled room uh, just over there. Uh, and so before you go for lunch, uh, make sure you stop there and uh, take a look at the wonderful Collins Hours. Uh, I want to thank also my colleagues uh, from the Schoenberg Institute, our uh, amazing director, Will Knoll, and my dear colleagues, especially Amy Hutchins and Mitch Frass, who so graciously volunteered to help assemble a display of some of the highlights from our own collection, uh, which will be on view tomorrow, also in the Lee Library, at the conclusion of the symposium at 5 p.m. So lots of opportunities to, to see manuscripts uh, all throughout this, this symposium. Um, and finally, I, I'd really like to thank uh, my colleague and friend, Lynn Ransom, curator of programs here at SIMS, who's really the, the progenitor of this annual symposium and, and who's worked tirelessly behind the scenes to get our speakers here in one piece and to help define, yeah, to, to help define the program. And, um, Lynn, really and, and to generally uh, uh, make sure everyone gets here in, yeah, in one piece and, uh. and everything uh, happens without a hitch. Um, now, uh, Will mentioned a little bit last night, it's an exciting time uh, for us uh, in, 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 at SIMS and in manuscript studies worldwide. Uh, our institute here is now in its fifth year. We have well-established projects. You saw last night uh, we are uh, about to launch uh, uh, the public interface for Bibliophily, our digitization platform, uh, and you'll be able to see all the manuscripts in Philadelphia, uh, including the Collins Hours, uh, when, this, when this project complete, uh, wraps up very soon. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, mention our uh, peer-reviewed uh, print and online biannual journal, Manuscript Studies. Uh, there's a new issue that's just come out, uh, so please take a look at it. it it'll be at the, uh, on, at the uh, table uh, just by the elevators. And um, subscribe to it, or, or get your institution to subscribe to it. It's a wonderful journal uh, with uh, amazing contributions from many people who are actually present here today. So to turn to the idea behind the conference to give a little bit of context before we hear from our speakers. Uh, so as you know, the, the, the goal of this symposium is to examine the interplay between manuscript illumination and other media broadly writ. The field of manuscript studies, of course, I don't need to tell you this, is, is very vibrant. Uh, and at least in, uh, in the kind of Western European context, it's gained a lot from its association uh, over the decades 
uh, on the one hand with the study of literature and on the other with the expansive field of book history. But one area where it has not truly been integrated is in its relation to other modes of artistic production. In my own field of specialty, uh, so 15th century French and Italian uh, illumination, this isolation of manuscript illumination as an as a, as a art form that stands on its own came across in two foundational exhibitions uh, and, uh, held in the mid-1990s and their catalogs. Uh, and these projects really set the bar for the next two decades of study. So this is uh, Quand la peinture était dans les livres, when painting was in books, at, from the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, put together by François Avril and Nicole Reynaud in 1993. And on the right, the painted page, uh, that was. this is an exhibition that was held uh, at the Morgan Library in 1994, 95. Uh, with Jonathan Alexander and Lillian Armstrong. Uh, and uh, these were amazing exhibitions I didn't get to see. Of course, I was too young, but uh, the, 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 the imprint, the imprint, uh, um, I mean, you know, I mean, I was precocious, but not that precocious, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, these, these, but the, the imprint of these major, major exhibitions uh, and their catalogs really, really uh, ha had an effect on, on this whole field of study. Um, and uh, especially this, this first catalog on the left, and this, this, this went, went, you know, literally called When Painting Was in Books, kind of unearthed this whole field, this whole uh, uh, constellation of regional centers of manuscript illumination in, in France. But uh, it, it, as the title suggests, it sort of stands in isolation. When Painting Was in Books, and uh, there's not much discussion of interaction with the world of tapestry, sculpture, metalwork, architecture, drawing, uh, other art forms like music and theater, uh, not to mention uh, 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 panel painting and fresco. Um, so, uh, you know, these are all, all allied art forms that despite their differing survival rates were intimately linked to the manuscript page in, in so many different ways. So one of the goals of this symposium is to kind of uh, revisit the conclusions of these and other kind of major projects of the past few decades on manuscripts, not just in a Western European context, but globally, uh, and to kind of you know, revise or revisit their conclusions in light of, of all these new discoveries uh, that, that have been made in so many different areas in the past few decades. Now, if you really want to learn about a topic, teach it, right? And this semester, I've really had the privilege of uh, co-teaching a graduate seminar with Professor David Kim uh, from History of Art uh, that has the same title as the conference, so Illuminations, uh, Manuscript Medium Message. Uh, and um, so here we are on the right looking at Simon Marmion at the PMA, a painting that uh, Susie mentioned in her uh, keynote last night. And up on the left, of course, as, we have, as we've had manuscripts in, uh, at, in our digitization lab uh, from all over Philadelphia, we've had uh, an amazing opportunity to catalog these manuscripts and, and to, to show them uh, to a few of our uh, students. So up here on the left, uh, we are looking at the amazing Romain de la Rose from the Philadelphia Museum of Art as well. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience teaching this course. Uh, our students are here, hopefully all here in the audience, uh, paying close attention. And uh, they've all become, uh, over the past few months, really experts in, in uh manuscript illumination and its relationship to other art forms. So I encourage you to seek them out and to talk to them uh, uh, about, uh, about this, these questions. Um, together as a class, we've explored the relationship of illumination uh, to other art forms through multiple uh, lenses. So we've looked at the technical and material substrata shared between manuscript illumination and other art forms, the social context of guild regulations and standards of practice in the late Middle Ages and, and early modern period that prescribed what was possible and what was not possible for a single artist to produce. We've looked at the complex relationship between the miniature and the monumental, which often interact in, in surprising ways. And we've looked at the role of historiographical and institutional traditions that structure our approach to works of art. And we've asked how we can transcend these, uh, uh, transcend these restrictions or alter the conditions by looking afresh at, at, at familiar material. As Susie uh, so expertly showed us in her keynote last night, we have a lot to gain from breaking down these disciplinary barriers uh, and medium-related barriers. And I hope this symposium will serve to show how fruitful such an approach can be. So accordingly, we've tried to bring together a roster of speakers from 
all sorts of different fields, conservation, curation, academic teaching. And while our speakers may have divergent training and institutional roles, they each cross over these barriers in, in fascinating ways. And we're all, uh, when we work on manuscripts, we're all in some ways hybrid uh, beings that exist between the walls of the classroom, the library, the museum, the conservation lab. So each of the papers, I hope, will, it will take up some of these challenges uh, and attempt to transcend some of these barriers by, by addressing these issues. We're going to begin our program. I'm going to run through the, the program just briefly to, to sort of explain the rationale behind it. I think that helps frame a, a, a symposium nicely. Um, and uh, the first session, we're organized in these, in these uh, sessions of two speakers. The first one, challenging media hierarchies. So it became clear that in order to really set things off on, on the right tone, uh, uh, we needed uh, papers that really uh, address uh, the, the, the um, hundreds of years of art historical writing and scholarship that have put in place a kind of strict uh, pecking order of artistic production, this triumvirate of large-scale painting, architecture, and sculpture which dominate. So how do we interrogate original sources and come to different conclusions about the relative value uh, of a whole panoply of, of other medieval and early modern art forms? How does illumination, manuscript illumination, fit into this expanded field of relative values? And so Laura Weigert and, and Sonia Drimmer will investigate this in the first session. Uh, then we have a, a kind of uh, 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 what's called a workshop. Uh, the symposium traditionally has these sort of workshop sessions where a major project is discussed. And so uh, the first workshop this morning uh, we'll have Frederick Elsig and Carmen Decu Teodorescu from the University of Geneva. And over the past decade or so, uh, uh, Frederick and his team in Geneva have run this amazing uh, uh, project that's really rewriting the history of painting in France in the 15th and 16th centuries. One conference every year on one region in France published amazingly, immediately, a, a, within a year. So there's a whole string of volumes uh, that, that they've published and they brought experts together uh, and they've really looked at artistic production ac across media and looked at, at painting in a kind of expanded way. And they're going to talk about that and the role of manuscript illumination and their kind of new vision of, uh, of, of this period. Then we have lunch, viewing of the Collins hours. Uh, and then a session uh, that, that, that seemed to make sense um, uh, with, with the two speakers we had in mind, narrativity. Uh, of course, manuscript illumination is... is uh, one of its characteristic elements is that it can display a narrative uh, serially. You can uh, flip through to numerous uh, illuminations within a single book. Uh, so how is that reflected in other art forms? How is that reflected, for example, in wall painting, uh, where you can also get the presence of numerous episodes uh, at once? Um, and uh, then we're going to move on in the, uh, in the afternoon to uh, Brian Keane and Roger Wick, who will each be talking about kind of case studies. So how do we anchor uh, the, the, the sort of general uh, uh, phenomena of, of exchange across media in the social world of specific individuals? So Brian has done this through extensive close looking and archival research across a large body of material. Roger uh, has done this uh, uh, through uh, uh, an, an amazing exhibition uh, held at the Morgan Library in 2000. 2001, sorry, I should have known that, um, on Jean Poyer. The, so this is the first monographic exhibition on an illuminator who was, of course, also a painter uh, in North America. So uh, Roger will offer us some reflections on that. That takes us to tomorrow morning, uh, where we're going to have a, a first session that's going to examine uh, ideas of community, technique, and practice. So recognizing that fundamentally, uh, uh, intermediality is a condition of, of social practice, of artistic practice. And uh, these two papers will examine this. Uh, uh, Nancy Turner uh, will uh, share some of her amazing knowledge uh, of, of the kind of technical aspects of manuscript illumination and how they relate to painting, but also her, her work uh, uh, on uh, uh, theories of communities of practice and how uh, illuminators who also work as painters work in this kind of system of overlapping Venn diagrams of, of specialties and of techniques. Um, we're then going to move on to a uh, second workshop in the afternoon. No, it's still in the morning. Uh, another amazing project uh, that's, that's really been path-breaking 
Uh, and this is uh, Stella Panayotova and Paola Ricciardi from the Fitzwilliam Museum. This, this is the uh, Miniare scientific campaign uh, to, to examine uh, and, and illuminated manuscripts technically. Many of you will know that the technical examination, uh, the use of technology to understand how manuscripts are made, um, was, you know, until very recently, really in its infancy compared to uh, the, the technical examination of panel paintings and other art forms. Uh, but this project has really changed that, and the result of it was a, an incredible exhibition at the Fitzwilliam Museum in 2016, uh, and a great catalog, which is, a, again, a fundamental resource. We assign chapters of it to our students, uh, and so we're going to hear about uh, 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 their, uh, their work and their uh, integrated analyses of illuminated manuscripts. Our last two sessions address uh, an issue that also is important in, uh, in looking at manuscript illumination and how it relates to other art forms, and that's the idea of ornament. Ornament uh, has often been dismissed historiographically, right? It's, it's frivolous. It doesn't really serve a narrative purpose. But of course, ornament is an amazing kind of vehicle of uh, artistic uh, ideas. Ornament is scalable. It can be large. It can be small. You know, it can be on a building. It can be in a manuscript. Uh, it's also something that can cross geographies and time scales. So we're going to hear from uh, Renata Halud, Ben Tillman, Shreve Simpson, and Georgi uh, Parpulov uh, about varying aspects of this, this idea of, of ornament. Um, and I should note that Renata and, and Shreve are both going to be speaking about discoveries they've made uh, relating to manuscripts uh, here in Philadelphia. So one manuscript at the Penn Museum and one manuscript uh, in, in the Lewis Collection at the Free Library. Uh, and this is very timely because as our Bibliophily project, our digitization project on uh, Western manuscripts in Philadelphia concludes, uh, we've, also, we've received a second grant uh, from the Council of Library and Information Resources uh, for a, a major new digitization project which is underway now, Manuscripts of the Muslim Worlds, um, with my colleague and friend Mitch Frass as a PI on this, on this big project, to digitize all of the uh, uh, manuscripts from the Islamicate world in Philadelphia. And so it's very exciting to have Shreve uh, talk about uh, what she's found in the margins of uh, Lewis Oriental MS1. Uh, and um, we'll end with Georgi Parpulov, who's, who's going to take us on this journey, I hope, of, of this uh, flower petal ornamentation uh, from China all the way to Byzantium. So uh, it's an exciting program. I can't wait to get started. I've already gone on too long. But uh, I hope um, this gives you an idea of, sort of some of what we're trying to accomplish with this symposium and, and, and a little bit of what you can expect. Um, so having done all this, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce my uh, friend, uh, co-teacher, and general partner in crime, David Kim, from the History of Art Department, to introduce our first set of speakers. David. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Kim. I'm an assistant professor in the history of art department. Um, the running joke in our classes, I'm a, I was trained as a painting person. And so the running joke in our classes, I hope to be the best student in Nick's class. So I hope I'm measuring up. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce, or moderate rather, this morning's um, session on uh, challenging uh, media hierarchies. And our first um, speaker is that. Let me introduce um, Sonia Drummer from UMass Amherst. Um, Sonia is assistant professor um, of medieval art and architecture there at UMass Amherst. Um, she specializes in the study of manuscript illumination of the British Isles and Northern Europe. I was very pleased to learn um, uh, over dinner last night that her book, The Art of Illu Illusion, Illuminators and the Making of English Literature, 1403-1476, was just published by University of Pennsylvania Press um, three weeks ago. Congratulations. Um, you can find the book. Um, it's, I, I stole it from the stand, but it's actually available. And you, if you put in the Schoenberg discount, you get a Schoenberg, you get a discount. So please do order this book um, during lunch. Um, and in this book, um, did I do that okay, Sonia? All right. So the book that present, it, it's a book that presents the first major art historical study dedicated to the emergence of the Middle English literary canon, literary canon as an illustrated corpus. So arguing that this um, canon was not necessarily only transmitted, but actually made, physically made through these images. 
Um, Drimmer has also advanced such innovative notions as um, the ambigraph, a term that refers to how manuscript producers were motivated by an awareness that a manuscript is at once a copy of something else and an original object in itself, furthering a tension between manuscript as duplicate on one hand and physical document on the other. A very active um, public humanist, Sonia Drimmer, um, is, uh, can be seen on a number of social um, platforms. She's published um, in a, a number of media outlets, um, actually giving us a model for how to convey our scholarship in more public forum. Um, and please join me in welcoming Sonia um, Drimmer. Her title is When an English Manuscript is an Italian Printed Book. So, Sonia. <laughs> Is this the lead? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. We're good. Mm -hmm. We're okay. Good. Oh, hello. This is a full house. Um, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I am so thrilled to be here because I feel as if I am among a mass of manuscriptophiles, uh, among whom are many people who influenced me as I was writing the book that um, was just so <laughs> nicely wielded before you. Um, I was also thrilled to receive this invitation, and I should pause. You can all hear me, yeah? Okay. I was also thrilled to receive this invitation because it's given me an opportunity to talk about a manuscript that has been rattling around in my brain since 2010, 2011, when I worked as a pre-doctoral curatorial intern uh, at the British Library on the Royal Manuscripts Exhibition. So this is my first public airing of those thoughts, and if nothing else, I hope it gives you some thoughts as well. In 1490, a manuscript of majestic heft was given to Henry VII of England, and you see the presentation on the right here. The volume, now British Library, Manuscript Arundel 66, is a cornucopia of astrological and prophetic material, including Killingworth's tables for determining the phases of the moon, a catalog of major constellations uh, based on Ptolemy's Almagest, Guido Bonatti's astrological calculations, prophecies ascribed to Merlin, and so forth. It's got it all. Uh, apt to the stargazing content are the dazzling illuminations that flicker across its pages, some in technicolor array. However, in a catalog entry devoted to this manuscript, Kathleen L. Scott characterized the work of one of its illuminators, the one you see here, as follows. Quote, the style and technique of illustrator B represent a typical degeneration, that's my emphasis, from the competence of the third quarter of the century. Illustrator B's figure drawing is unskilled, colors have lost their clear intensity and are either muddy or ill-applied, and shading of drapery and self-color has been replaced by straight lines in black or by outlining in a contrasting color. The century-long convention of placing plants on a grassy surface is disastrously altered by the use of black for the usual green or yellow flora. Illustrator B's work is naive in the extreme. Uh, descriptions such as this are familiar to those of us who work on manuscript illumination from England of the 15th century, a period that is often dismissed as the nadir in the history of its art. In perhaps the most memorable and my absolute favorite summation of the period's artistic output, Janet Backhouse lamented that, quote, manuscripts identifiably illuminated in England during the final decade of the 15th century and the first 10 years of the 16th await serious study, preferably by someone prepared to enjoy rather than to despise their splendid vulgarity. <laughs> and uh, that's also my emphasis. Now, now, when I hear the words vulgar and degenerate, I feel personally summoned. <laughs> so, so I would like to take up Backhouse's invitation today, if not for reasons of blind devotion to bad art, although I do have that as well. Um, while many flaws could be ascribed to the illuminations in this manuscript, it would not be entirely just to lay them at the feet of the hapless illustrator B. For what is not mentioned in the description above, uh, or this description, and what remains unacknowledged in any public sources on, published sources on the manuscript is that these miniatures are copies of woodcuts found in a, print, in a book produced by a German printer in Italy. In my
my paper this morning, I'd like to focus on this manuscript as, to quote from the symposium's abstract, quote, a point of contact and transfer across time and space. Arundel 66 is an ideal object for attending to this theme, and in particular for disrupting a number of paradigms in manuscript study, and even more broadly, the historical disciplines at large, if I can be so ambitious today. Far from unique, Arundel 66 is one of legions of extant manuscripts, with illumination copied directly from printed media. As such, it offers an important case study of intermedial exchange in pre-modern Europe, and it gives rise to numerous questions that bear on how manuscript scholars of the late medieval period carry out our work. Challenging aesthetic categories, technological progressivism, regional style history, and connoisseurial practice, Arundel 66 demands that we reposition our very idea of manuscript illumination within the media ecology and even the art history of late medieval Europe. So to put my argument today in its most terse formulation, a manuscript is never simply itself. Obviously, I cannot help myself being vulgar and degenerate, and I start with a pun. Cribbing and incunable. Um, the Arundel volume is a codicologically fascinating object, and two fascinating, um, equally fascinating articles by Hilary Carey and Joanna Franska draw attention to these features while making other important arguments about these books. So uh, this, excuse me, this manuscript, Arundel 66, has recently been written about extensively by Hilary Carey and Joanna Franska, and so I should say that I'm building upon their work. The manuscript was made as a series of four separate booklets, all apparently copied by the same scribe in what appears to have been an unbroken span of time. So it's four separate booklets, but it looks like an uninterrupted um, campaign. The scribe even helpfully added a colophon. However, this colophon produces more questions than it answers, and I want to draw your attention to this text down here. It appears on a blank leaf at the end of the third booklet, so not at the end of the entire manuscript, and it records in a kind of casual script more commonly seen in manuscript uh, excuse me, um, instructions, and that's what you're looking at here. This book, I'll say it in English, this book by Guido, uh, Guido Bonatti of Forli was finished in the year of Christ 1490 on the 30th day of June, 12 hours and 24 minutes, compiled and brought up to date by me, John Wells, in the fourth year of King Henry VII and in the fifth year of the pontificate of our most holy father in Christ, Pope Innocent IV. I suspect that this hastily written note was an instruction for the colophon proper for the scribe to return to, which might have appeared in a more elegant hand at the top of the page. Whatever the case may be, something was certainly intended for this page, which never made it into the final product. Since the ruling of the column A, or the left column, has been scraped as have roughly two dozen lines of text. So uh, see the ruling in column B? No ruling here, it's all been scraped. And I have just contacted the British Library to ask that they do some UV light on this portion of the page because you can see some writing there that's been scraped. And um, I await the UV photography. Um, they're a little busy now with Anglo-Saxon stuff. <laughs> I don't blame them. Now, there are many other anomalies in this volume which I won't address today, but this is all to say, so here's the important point, that even when a manuscript presents itself in candid, straightforward language as the product of a particular set of operations executed at a very specific moment in time, this self-presentation often obscures far more convoluted procedures. And I'm going to return to this idea of self-misrepresentation later. And one of these convolutions, and the center of my talk this morning, is the section containing an illustrated copy of Ptolemy's Almagest in its Latin translation. The text of the Almagest, which is a catalog of stars and description of constellations, had, to my knowledge, no tradition of illumination, and I'll, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but to my knowledge it didn't, um, but rather appeared in tabular form, like the image that you see on the left. So this is um, each one of these. You'll see the headings, their descriptions of constellations, and then we get told where each of the stars is with respect to the constellation's body. And this is an example of um, a typical Almagest manuscript that I pulled almost at random. However, here on the right, in the Arundel manuscript, 
um, uh, it is accompanied by 39 miniatures illustrating almost all of the constellations included. So for example, the uh, entry for Cassiopeia details where each of the stars appears over the imagined body of Cassiopeia, a star over her head, one over her seat just above her thighs, and so forth. But as I mentioned in my opening, uh, the illustrations are not unique to this manuscript. And since the Almagest had no illustrative tradition of which I'm aware, they're not even particular to this text. Rather, the miniatures in this manuscript are freehand copies of woodcut prints that accompany an edition of a different text. Uh, and I say they're freehand because I've measured all of the, um, the illustrations in this book and in this one, and the measurements are, are different. Um, and I don't see any evidence of pouncing or anything of that nature or tracing. Um, that text is Hyginus's Poetica Astronomica, which was published by the German printer Erhard Ratzelt from his press in Venice in 1482 and illustrated with blocks cut by Johann Zandritte. The figure of Cassiopeia demonstrates well the Arundel illuminator's debt to the printed source. In the manuscript illumination, a woman sits on a boxy bench with her feet planted firmly on its base and her hands outstretched and tied by two ropes to poles on either side. She wears a draped garment down to her ankles, which falls open to reveal her breasts and is slung over her right shoulder. She looks to her right, our left, where from her hand descends a cascading liquid. Finally, superimposed over her figure are the all important stars over her head, shoulders, torso, knee, feet, as well as over the base of her seat. All of the features that I just laid out for you could accurately describe the woodcut print. So I was just describing this image, but you could transpose my description to the woodcut image. Now, the Almagest aside, astrological texts were thoroughly and frequently illuminated throughout the Middle Ages, and the iconography of the constellations was, with some variations, largely settled. In fact, astrological images are the most continuous visual thread from antiquity to the Renaissance, and an entire subfield of both Warburgian and Panofskian analysis has fixated on tracking the continuities. And one of my major reservations about tackling this, and why I've been letting it rattle around in my head since 2010, is that there is so much literature on the transmission of constellations that it is a daunting bibliography. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not scientifically inclined to begin with. So as soon as I hear anything that it's about astronomy, I'm sort of turned away from it, but I couldn't help myself. Um, it was the vulgarity of it. Uh, <laughs> um, so to cut to the chase then, and, and let me just say that these, again, almost pulled at random, are images of Cassiopeia from lots of different manuscripts from the 9th century to the 14th. Um, to cut to the chase then, the Arundel Cassiopeia resembles a bevy of Cassiopeias from the 9th century to the time of this manuscript's production. What makes me so sure that it derives from Rattelt's 1482 edition? Well, the answer to this question rests in two key areas, details and circumstance. Let me start with the details. Characteristic of the Cassiopeias in Arundel and Rattelt is a seat that angles away from the picture plane to suggest some spatial recession. Additionally, the seat's dado features ornament that resembles a lancet window topped with some plate tracery. Cassiopeia herself twists her trunk and turns her head away from her legs, while a textual label identifies her to the left. That the Arundel illumination derives from the Ratzelt print is supported further by two key nuances that they don't share. The first is the bizarre comb hovering just above her hand in the illumination. Uh, the second are the flat top stakes to which Cassiopeia is lashed. These details originated in the illuminator's attempt to square his visual source with the specifics of the text at hand. Remember, these are two different texts here. Um, uh, remember that the illuminated, again, this is Ptolemy, and then this is um, uh, Hyginus, right? So while Hyginus places a star on Cassiopeia's mamidia, or breast, Ptolemy has the star on her pectore, chest, and I've circled it to the right over there. And this would be absolutely fine, except that the illuminator misread pectore as pectere, meaning comb. <laughs> Spent... I spent a whole day working on that. <laughs> I was very excited when I found out. My husband was not as thrilled when I told him about this. <laughs> but you all are, right. 
that's what counts. So uh, uh, likewise, while Hygienus has her bound to a silly quastro or a kind of tree, Ptolemy cites only a polynom, a pole. So such correspondences are, and textually derived discrepancies occur across the illuminations in the Arundel manuscript and the Ratolt edition. Moving on to circumstance. While I cannot point to a precise copy that the Arundel artist used, there is ample evidence that the book would have been available in England at the time. As scholars such as Lottie Halinga and Paul Needham have shown in important censuses, Venice was by far the greatest supplier of incunables to England. And Martin Lowry writes that, quote, it is virtually certain that there was a direct and regular link between the Venetian publishing houses and their customers at the opposite end of Europe. This is an important observation because prior to what he found, many people thought that any Italian incunables that ended up in England had been bought individually by traveling English people. But in fact, there are ships bringing them. So, um, so bringing them in mass. So he adds as an example that merchant galleys sailed from Venice for Flanders in England in the late summer of 1482. According to its colophon over here, Rattled's Hygienus was printed in Venice on 14 October, 1482, so it just missed the boat, literally. With a five century gap, it's hard to judge reliably, but I do think that it's telling that in Europe, England currently has the second largest number of the 1482 edition of this text with its 20 volumes following Italy's 31. Incidentally, the US, we, have the greatest number of all coming in at 33. Dog bits gets to dollars, a lot of them came from England. Um, so moreover, Henry VII, the dedicatee and recipient of the Arundel Manuscript, was both an avid patron of Italian humanists and consumer of continental printed books, including 42 books printed by Antoine Berard alone. Finally, Thomas Daneman, the astronomer and physician to Henry VII's own mother, Margaret Beaufort, owned at least one Ratzolt edition, albeit of a different text. So none of what I've outlined here is conclusive. It's not a smoking gun, but I do think it shows that the conditions were right for a rattle hygienist to be floating around London stationer's shops. So this possibility leads me to ask a question that I'm going to answer at the end of my talk. And the question is this, why would an illuminator in London use the rattled hygienist prints to illustrate the text of Ptolemy's Almagest, especially when reproductions, uh, representations of the constellations were not exactly recherche, they weren't hard to come by. And another question, why is this important for us as manuscript scholars? Now we can begin to walk our way toward an answer to this question, sorry. <laughs> We can begin to walk our way to an answer to this question of why printed images were used in service of manuscript ones by examining the working methods not of the Arundel illuminator, but rather of the printer Erhard Ratzolt. Ratzolt was an avid poacher of sources, as so many printers were, and thanks to the tireless research of Ulrika Bauer and Kristen Lippincott, we know that he found illustrations for Hygienus's Poetica Astronomica not for manuscripts of the Poetica Astronomica, which were illuminated. So that te this text was illuminated in manuscripts, um, but rather for manuscripts of yet another astrological text, Michael Scott's Liber Introductorius. And we know this because features of the constellations that are unique to Scott, so to this text, crop up in Ratzolt's images. For example, Specific to Michael Scott is the representation of the constellation Andromeda as a beautiful young woman with male genitals, a configuration probably deriving from her name, which begins with andro, the Greek word for male. And if you love etymology, as I think most me uh, uh, medievalists do, that's for you. Um, uh, in the subsequent edition, she was flipped, or they were flipped, and their genitalia was redacted. So here's our later edition with our redaction. Likewise, Cassiopeia features loose tresses of hair and blood pouring from her hand. I couldn't say why Ratzolt used the Scott illuminations, and the answer could be as simple as his having an unillustrated hygienist text and an illustrated Michael Scott to hand. I mean, I think that's probably what it was. To summarize, here we, are, we see one image, our Cassiopeia, hitching a ride with texts one, two, and three across your screen. 
This pictorial wanderlust, if you like, is a meaningful act, and a hallmark of late medieval book production, one that is acknowledged indirectly in the envoy to the printed edition of Ratzold's text. So I'll return to this envoy now. <laughs> Following the conclusion of Hyginus's text proper is an extended envoy from Ratzold himself, as well as Jacob Santinus, the editor of the text, and Johann Zandritte, the cutter of the woodblocks. Both Zentinus and Zandritte refer to their labor as one of correction and improvement, and that's common enough. But what's interesting to me is they tell the reader to compare their own product to, quote, the work of Hyginus's men, first written by hand, or to that which was printed first. This was not the Editio Princeps. There was another printed edition of this text. In other words, this standard appeal to the reader's benevolence that features so commonly in medieval envoys has been transformed into a challenge to the reader's own editorial discerning. If you don't like it, go look at the other edition. Now, this challenge may be disingenuous or merely a topos, but it was written with the expectation that it would be intelligible to the audience because they did indeed have access to compar comparanda, at least in theory. This comparanda conjures an environment of not just consumption, but also production amidst the abundance and variety that print was facilitating, and more importantly, a variety that is furnished by the apparatus of the press, where text and image are not just separable, but also fungible, and anyone who has worked on early print has had the fun adventure of following the same woodcuts traveling with different texts. And I also think this fungibility is something that we saw in Laura's talk preceding mine. Now that such commutative actions were taken up by the producers of manuscripts in this same period should be no surprise. And again, I want to refer to Laura's talk where we see habits that are established in the printer shop now being taken up in, um, by, by people in other media. So working habits then are not only determined by technology, but also by what human actors establish as a working norm. What I mean by this is that once print technology had facilitated fungibility, right, you take your, your woodcut, your, your image, and you can stick it in with different texts, um, the procedure became a norm that diffused to other non-print media, generating hybrid progeny. And this idea of progeny or generation is one that I'd like to pursue. In her assessment of Arundel 66, Kathleen Scott expressed surprise at the apparent degeneration of the Illuminator's work from the style that dominated in the preceding decades, and Janet Backhouse marveled at such Illumination's vulgarity. I want to end by lingering on these words in particular because of how they complicate our fundamental notions of transmission and temporality, troubling in particular a generational paradigm of production that is the bedrock of traditional philology. I think there is something very telling about objections on the grounds of degeneration with its linguistic root in procreation and procreation gone bad, if you like, and vulgarity with its own roots in vulgus or the masses, so its own kind of proliferation. Manuscripts deriving from print might indeed be both of these things, that is, a degeneration of something originally vulgus, that is, made in mass quantities. Anne Blair has argued that during the incunabular period, the interactions between manuscript and print were particularly bidirectional. That observation alone mounts a significant challenge to the practices of periodization that posit print as a milestone marking the threshold to modernity, and I don't think anyone in this room believes that anymore. <laughs> Moreover, it demands a new definition, I think more importantly for us as art historians, moreover, it demands a new definition of representation itself, peculiar to late medieval bibliographical culture. At its most fundamental level, every hand-produced picture can be thought of as embodying two different kinds of representation, the subject that it represents and the hand of the person who created it, right? So this represents Cassiopeia, and because we can see the traces of the hand that produced it, it represents that person too. So this is the difference that they have in German, but we don't have in English, between Darstellen and Vertreten, right? Um, in addition, books, both manuscripts and print, are inherently a medium of the copy. And so they complicate this further by representing that which they copy. They're exemplars, and you can see where I'm going here in terms of procreation and progeny. In the case of manuscripts that copy from incunables, they further complicate the media, excuse me, represent the medium of their source. So um, I'm saying here that this is also copied from a print book as it is. It's bringing in the print book. It's representing it. 
Indeed, features of the Arundel manuscript are downright skeuomorphic, emulating pragmatic elements of the printed book's production process entirely unnecessary to the manuscript, such as the appearance of catchwords on subsequent pages. So I just gave you a random spread, 78V through 80 recto, and we've got catchwords on every page and in column A. Why would you put a catchword there? Why do this except to liken the handmade object to the mechanically reproduced one, at least in part? So early printed books have catchwords on almost every page. This aspect of late medieval manuscript representation and referentiality ultimately leads us to question the ingrained practices of connoisseurship that, like it or not, and I like it, are at the foundation of what we do. It causes us to ask, whose hand is being represented here? What region is being expressed? What time period, if not only the one of its unfinished colophon? Is what we are seeing only a manuscript illumination, or is it also a facsimile of the printed book or the woodcut print? If it is at least in part the latter, then it is somehow unfaithful to itself, representing something else. It may be this aspect that, if subconsciously, Scott perceived as a degeneration and backhouse as vulgar. That which we accept as more advanced print over manuscript is here configured as an atavistic backslide or a corruption, issues that are, I think, especially urgent and even poignantly urgent uh, when we contemplate such figures as Andromeda and the philological <sighs> conundra that queered her. There is much more to be said, and I say that leaving you on, on that that provocative point about Andromeda. But I will conclude for now by saying that I, for one, am energized by the idea that this English manuscript is not simply an English manuscript, but is also an Italian printed book. Thank you.